you're not already there, please turn to Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. We'll be there momentarily. Every day I pray for people that don't know Jesus. I have a long list. For some of them I've been praying for more than four decades for them to be saved. I've had people ask me, what do you pray for lost people? I pray scripture. And one of the scriptures that I pray for them is for conviction. You don't hear much about that anymore. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I pray John 16 verse 8 for them. It's a verse that comes from the night before Jesus died on the cross. Look at it there on the screen. And he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world, that's lost people, concerning three things, sin and righteousness and what? Say it out loud. Judgment. Did you hear those words? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, why does the Holy Spirit have to be the one to convict us of that? Why don't we just think about our sin, our righteousness, our lack thereof? Why don't we think about the fact that one of these days we're going to stand before God in judgment? Why? Because we don't. We're sinful. We're self-focused, and it takes conviction. It takes Holy Spirit conviction. People don't naturally think about these things. People are not naturally convicted. It takes the Holy Spirit to show us and to convict us concerning our sin. We don't really think we're that bad. It takes the Holy Spirit to show us that our righteousness, the very best we can do, is not good enough to get into heaven. And people rarely think about the fact, the biblical teaching, that everybody, including me and you, are going to stand one-on-one with God and be judged and give an account for how you lived your life. Many people, if they do think about that, they say, well, if there's a God, I know He's a loving God, and He will let everybody go into heaven. Oh, He is a loving God, but He's not going to let everybody go into heaven. Some say, well, if I do more good things than bad things, there's a scale up there somewhere. And if I'll just do more good than bad, I'll get in. That is not the way it works. Somebody says, well, I know. I, I don't know. I don't know if I believe in heaven or not, but I sure don't believe in hell. A loving God would never send anybody to hell. Well, there's a problem with all of that. There is a heaven and there is a hell. I'll be finishing preaching through Revelation this month. There are four Sundays in October. Today we're going to talk about the final judgment. Next week I'm going to take a whole sermon and preach from Revelation 20 verse 15 about the doctrine of hell. Did you know, if I've counted correctly, if not, I'll correct it this week, that Gehenna, the lake of fire, hell, is referred to 11 times in the New Testament, and Jesus mentioned it 10 of those 11 times. Did you know that Jesus talked more about hell than any other person in the Bible? You think about that this week. There is a heaven, there is a hell, and everyone in the world 
will spend eternity in either heaven or hell based on their relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit has to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment, because without that, you'll never even desire to get saved. In the Bible, there are actually three judgments. Whenever I preach on this, somebody might say, well, you got a typo there. It says judgments, plural. That's because there are three. It's not just one, there's three. And I'm going to walk through those today with you systematically. And the last one is where we will go verse by verse through the text of Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. I told you at the get-go, and if you don't know what that means, it means at the beginning that I was going to walk through and preach through every verse of Revelation, and I will do that, I promise you. First thing I want you to see is the judgment of saints. Now, what is a saint? A saint is a Christian, somebody who has trusted Jesus. In the Old Testament, the saints were those who looked forward to the Messiah. They repented of their sins. They believed in the Messiah, and they looked toward Jesus. Even though they didn't know it was Jesus, they looked toward the Messiah. And then when Jesus came, those who repented of their sins, believed in Jesus while he was on this earth, and everybody since then is a saint. What is a saint? A saint is not something, the church can't make you a saint. No, no, no. God makes you a saint the moment he, moment he saves you. What it means is he sanctifies you, and that means he separates you from the world unto himself. You belong to him now. You don't belong to yourself. You don't belong to this world. You are a saint by God sanctifying you. So that's what a saint is, and the saints are going to be judged. At the rapture, the saints will be taken up into heaven, and upon their arrival, they will immediately stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. The bema is the Greek word, and we will be judged. Now, you, some of you don't believe that, I know, but it's going to happen, and when you get there, even if you didn't believe in it, I just want you to remember that I told you so, all right? It is going to happen. Paul wrote to Christians and said, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let me give you the two verses that say that, and then we'll go in a minute to the verse that actually describes Christians standing before at the bema of Christ. Paul said in Romans 14, 10, to the Roman Christians, that's who he was speaking to. Don't forget it. But you, why do you judge your brother? They had brothers in Christ. Are you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? Why do you constantly judge your fellow Christian? That's what he's saying. For we, Paul even puts himself in there with him, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. We means Paul is with them. He says, we all will, all Christians will stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, how many of that, that's in your Bible? Anybody out there? Okay. Some of you didn't get your hands up. You got a bad Bible. All right. Second Corinthians 5.10, same thing. For we must all, everybody say all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And he said again, we, he includes himself with them so that each one may be recompensed, that you may be rewarded for your deeds in the body, according to what you've done, whether good or bad, you're going to be rewarded good or bad. Doesn't mean you're going to go to hell. Doesn't mean if you're Christian, you're going to lose your salvation, but it does mean you're going to be judged. Your works are going to be judged at the bema of Christ. It's crystal clear. He's talking to Christians in these two verses. There's no doubt. Christians will not be judged regarding their salvation. That's secure. But we will be ju judged for our works. What does that mean? Our words, we'll get to that momentarily, our deeds, our thoughts, our motives, our attitudes, everything like that, after you got saved, you're going to be judged for it. Now, when is the time of this judgment? Immediately after the rapture. Immediately after the rapture. We're going to get caught up into the air, meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to be judged regarding our works. Who are the persons in this judgment? Saved people of all time, the saints. And what's the results? 
of this judgment. Rewards or loss of rewards. And we read about the Bema, we read about the judgment seat of Christ. It is a vivid picture. And I want you to follow with me. Please follow with me as I read to you from the screen 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. According, Paul says, to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And what he's saying there is, when I came to Corinth, I laid the foundation. I'm the one that led you to Christ. Go read about this in the book of Acts. Paul went to Corinth. Nobody was saved. He led them to Christ. He said, I laid the foundation. I'm the one that came. I'm the missionary God sent to Corinth. Like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. Now another is building on it. Now I've left. Pastors have come in. Elders have come in. People have come in. Teachers have come in. And they're building on my foundation. Another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, here it is. If any man builds on the foundation, and notice these elements, the first three will pass through fire, the second three will not. Because it is to be revealed with fire, it says, no one... Now, if any one man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, and then notice the last three that are perishable, are wood, hay, and straw. Let me just tell you what this is. It says in the next verse, each man's work will become evident. When you get saved, God starts classifying all of your works, all of your words, all of your motives all of your thoughts as gold, silver, precious stones, things that honor God, things that seek first the kingdom of God, things that are done for the glory of God, or wood, hay, and stubble. Things that are not for the word of God, are not for the will of God, things that are sinful, things that are not honoring to Christ. Everything you do is in one of those two categories after you get saved. Each man, verse 13's work will become evident for the day, that's the day of judgment, the day of standing before the judgment seat of Christ, will show it because it is revealed with fire. Now, where does that fire come from? Do you remember the eyes of the resurrected Lord Jesus? What are they? They're eyes of what? Fire. Jesus is going to look at all of the works All of your words, all of your deeds, all of your attitudes, all of that. He's going to look at it with eyes of fire. If it's for the glory of God, if it's seeking first the kingdom. And by the way, you can work at your job and seek first the kingdom of God. I'm not just saying that there's, you know, only the things like going to church. I'm not saying that. Look, you can live for the glory of God at work. You, if you work at a grocery store, you can work at a grocery store for the glory of God. Amen. If you work on the railroad, you can work on the railroad as for the glory of God. If you're a janitor, you can work as a janitor. You can clean things for the glory of God. All work that we call secular can become sacred if you do it for the Word of God, for the will of God, and for the glory of God. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on it, that is, on the foundation of Jesus, remains, he'll receive a what? Say it out loud. Now, Christians choke on this word, but say it out loud. Reward. If any man's work is burned up, it didn't, it wasn't done for the glory of God. What you did wasn't for the glory of God. We've all got some of that. 
It's burned up. He will suffer loss. Won't go to hell. But somehow he's going to suffer loss. But he himself will be saved yet as through fire. Now what is this saying? And what does it mean? It means what it says. Christian, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ. Oh, praise God, you'll be robed in the righteousness of Christ. Praise God, you'll be in the blood of Christ. Praise God, the name of Jesus will be upon you. But your works will be reviewed, not to determine eternal destiny, but to determine rewards. And I'm going to say it right here. Everybody is not going to be rewarded the same. Amen. Not fair, not fair. That's not how we play sports nowadays. Everybody gets to play. <laughs> Everybody ought to be treated the same. <laughs> God's not going to treat everybody the same. He's no respecter of persons. But if you get saved and you're not seeking first the kingdom of God, you're not reading your Bible on a regular basis, these works, look at me, these works don't save you, but they are the fruit that show you're saved. Works are not the root of salvation, but they are the fruit of salvation. And if you don't have any fruit, it's because you don't have any root. I'll talk to some people sometimes. It just amazes me. They'll say, well, my son, and I'm not trying to be ugly, but I'm just going to go on and say it. Well, my son hadn't been to church in 45 years, but way back yonder, he asked Jesus to come into his heart. So I know he's saved. He's not saved. He's not saved. You can't miss church 45 years and be saved. You can't do it. There was a flop at the first if there's not a finish line, all right? And just because you went through something or whatever it was you did, you can walk an aisle all you want to, and I'm all for walking aisles. But if you don't truly repent of your sins and truly believe in Jesus Christ and truly let him change you, listen, if there's no change, there's no Jesus. If there's no change, there's no Jesus. I'm coming. And your works are going to be judged. And whatever you did for the glory of God is going to be gold and silver and precious stone. And God will look at it. Let me tell you something. It's not just you. It's me. Every sermon I preach, if it's not for the glory of God, if I'm standing right here right now and it's not for the glory of God, it's going to be burned up at the judgment. If I sing a song or if you sing a song and we don't truly engage in it, it's going to be burned up at the judgment. If I give a tithe and it's not for the glory of God, it will be burned up at the judgment. If I don't seek first the kingdom of God, it's going to be burned up at the judgment. Do you understand how serious this is? Do you understand this is, God's not playing games, guys. Well, that's not what my Bible, I'm not interested in your Bible, your fabricated Bible. I'm talking about what the Bible says, not something you have made up. Well, that's not what my spiritual advisor, well, your spiritual advisor is wrong. It's appointed unto all men to die and after that the judgment. I have people come to me and they'll say, now, Brother Steve, that, that's just not biblical. And they'll say, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Over in the Psalms, he's thrown our sins as far as the east is from the west. Look, I'm not saying that you're going to lose your salvation. There's nothing incompatible with what I'm saying in those verses. But what I am saying to you is sometimes people take those verses and say, well, I'm saved. I'll just live however I want to because I am in Christ and I can sin, do whatever else. All my sins will be washed away. I got news for you, brother. You're going to face those sins again and you're going to be rewarded or not rewarded based on how you lived after Jesus Christ saved you. 
And if anybody tells you any different, they're not telling you the truth. Amen. No, there's no condemnation. You're going to get into heaven, but you're going to smell like smoke. Amen? You're going to pass through the fire. Romans 14, 12 says it. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Look at me. I'm not going to give an account for you, and you're not going to give an account for me. Your spouse is not going to give an account for you. You're not going to give an account for your spouse. I'm going to give an account for Steve Gaines, and you're going to give an account for you. Paul wrote that to Christians as well, the judgment of saints. You said, can you go on to the next one? Sure, here we go. Number two, the judgment of Satan. I really like this one. Revelation 20, verse 10, and the devil who deceived them. He is a deceiver, is he not? If you're supposed to go right, he'll tell you to go left. If you're supposed to go left, he'll tell you to go right. If you're supposed to go up, he'll tell you to go down. If you're supposed to go down, he'll tell you to go up. He is a deceiver. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. Can I have an amen in the house of God? Amen. Praise the living God. Where the beast and the false prophet are also, that's the antichrist and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever. The time, the end of the millennium. We read about that last week. At the very end of that thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, the devil will come out, get a bunch of people on the field, and God's going to just take him and throw him. I started to say chunk him. <laughs> He's going to just throw him into the pit of hell. Who are the persons, Satan, and all the fallen angels? How many of you believe in angels. Do you believe in angels? The Bible teaches about angels. Fallen angels are demons, and I'm telling you, demons and angels are real. You need to believe in the spirit world. It is more real than the physical world, even though we can't see it. I'm not talking about ghosts. I'm talking about demons. I'm talking about angels. These are, this is Satan and the fallen angels are going to be thrown into the lake of fire, and the results cast into the lake of fire. God promised the demise and the destruction of Satan way back in Genesis 3. After the very first sin, God promised that the devil who tempted his children, Adam and Eve, to sin, God promised that he was going to destroy them in Genesis 3, 15. God said to the devil... And I will put enmity between you and the woman, that is Eve, and between your seed and her seed. What do you mean? I, I know there are children here. Women don't have seed. I get it. That's, I believe, and most conservative theologians believe, that is the first reference to the Christ and to his virgin birth in the Bible. Because it goes on to say, between your seed, the devil's seed, and her seed, Jesus, and then, it's not an accident that H is capitalized, he, Jesus, shall bruise you on the head. Jesus bruised Satan on the head when he died on the cross and when he rose from the dead. And you shall bruise him on the heel. Now look. If, if somebody said to you, you got a choice, I'm either going to hit you in the head or I'm going to hit you on the heel, I hope you would choose the heel. Now, it does, you know, when you get a little older, your heels start hurting. Now, if that, you don't know what that is, just keep breathing. It'll come, it's, it'll come to you. Just keep on breathing. But I'd hold out rather somebody, and what he was saying is, you're the serpent. And you're going to strike my son on the heel. He's going to die on the cross. But I tell you what, in three days, I'm going to raise him up and he's going to crush your head. Amen. That's what God's saying. It's exactly what he's saying. You're going to be judged. How many of you know that the devil constantly accuses us of our sin? Does anybody know that? You can ask God to forgive you something years ago and he will. But then the devil will come along and not only remind you of it, but torture you with it. Say, so, you know, a real Christian never would have done that. You, you're not saved. Look at you. What do you. Who do you think you are? I got news for you, friend. 
Next time Satan reminds you of your sinful past, remind him of his future. He's going to hell. Satanists, Wiccans, witches, warlocks, voodooists, spiritists, all follow a doomed leader. Satan may have convinced them that he's going to win in the end, but that is a lie. The devil is a liar. Satan is a liar, and he's the father of lies, Jesus said in John 8, 44. That's the judgment of Satan. So we've seen the judgment of saints after the rapture, the judgment of Satan after the millennial reign. Now let's look at our text, the judgment of sinners. Go there now to Revelation 20, verse 11 and follow. We'll look at the great white throne judgment. This is not the Bema. This is not the judgment seat of Christ that takes place after the rapture. This is the great white throne judgment that takes place after the millennial reign. And this is not Christians standing before this. No, no Christians will be at the great white throne judgment. Only people who don't know Jesus. Then I saw a great white throne. And him who sat upon it. From whose presence earth and heaven fled away. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead. Great and the small. Standing before the throne and books were open. By the way, the great and the small. Death is the great equalizer. (laughs) You may be a big shot here. You're not going to be a big shot up there. I'll tell you that. Books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, and I'm going to do a whole sermon on this next week, he was thrown into the lake of fire. When is the time of this judgment? The end of the millennium. Jesus will return with the saints at the rapture, or at the second coming, reign for a thousand years, and then he will have the great white throne judgment. Who are these persons being judged? Lost people of all time. Everybody that rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And what are the results of this judgment? You're going to be cast into the lake of fire with the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Now let's just walk through the text. I told you, again, we're going to go through every verse, every word of Revelation. Here we go. God will judge sinners sovereignly. That is, he's going to do it as a king, as a reigning judge. He's the sovereign judge. He's the sovereign king. And he is in charge. Jesus Christ will judge them. Look at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. It's a great white throne because the one on it is magnificent and great. It is a white throne because the one sitting on it is totally sinless and 100% undefiled by any iniquity. He sat upon the great white throne He was sitting because he's large and in charge. I got news for you. God's not up in heaven wringing his hands saying, what am I going to do about COVID? God's not up in heaven wringing his hands saying, what am I going to do about this election? Man, that debate was a disaster. What am I going to do? What are we going to do about the economy? Oh, I don't know. God doesn't wring his hands like that. God's not afraid. God is sitting on his throne and he is large and he is in charge. He is a sovereign God. And the one sitting on that throne is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. What about God the Father? He gave all judgment to Jesus. Jesus said so. In John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, for not, Jesus said, for not even the Father judges anyone. But he has given all judgment, all, to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Look at me. 
If you don't honor Jesus, you don't honor God. If you don't come to Jesus, you don't come to God. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, God is not your Father. Jesus is the judge. Paul said the same thing in Acts 17 when he was preaching at Athens. I've stood on Mars Hill where he preached these words. I've stood there twice. He said, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he, God the Father, has fixed a day in which he, God the Father, will judge the world in righteousness. How? Through a man. He's going to judge through a man. That's Jesus, capital M, whom he, God the Father, has appointed, having furnished great proof to all men by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. God has appointed Jesus to be the judge. And when Jesus is appointed by God, Jesus is going to be the judge. You're going to stand before Jesus. Lost people are going to stand before Jesus who died for their sins so they could be saved, but they're not going to be saved because they rejected the cross. The one who desired to save them is now going to be their judge. The one who wanted to be their savior is now going to be their judge. The one who invited them to come to heaven is now going to sentence them to hell. The grandeur and glory of Jesus as divine judge is seen in that phrase that says, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. Nobody's going to be arrogant. Nobody's going to be popping off when they see Jesus. Nobody's going to be cocky and speaking vain things. No. It's an area where presence, whose presence, earth and heaven fled away. From whose presence? The great white throne is going to be sobering. If we could see it, we'd hit the deck. We would hit the deck. And no place was found for them. No place in heaven. They're not going to heaven. Heaven has walls. Heaven has borders. You can't just get in. Nobody, not all people get into heaven. To enter heaven, you've got to go through the gate that God said go through. And that gate is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate, talking about himself. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. There's a broad road that leads to destruction. All you'll have a bunch of buddies that'll go along and say, oh, it's going to be okay. Everything's okay. All the way to hell. The broad road that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, that gate. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. That is heaven. And there are few who find it. Comparatively, there are going to be millions that get saved, but there are going to be billions that go to hell. Millions are going to get saved, but billions are going to go to hell. Some are going to try to enter through their own doors, but to no avail. Jesus said in Luke 13, 24 and following, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door... That's Jesus. And you begin to stand outside and knock on the door. These are people trying to get into heaven. Saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to to you these horrible words, I don't know where you are from. Then they will begin to say, we ate, we drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. In other words, we went to church, we heard the sermon, and we were around you. And he will say, I tell you, I don't know where you're from. Depart from me, all you evildoers in that place. There will be weeping, gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, when you look into heaven, you can't get in. You see Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being thrown out. There aren't many doors to heaven. I've talked to people and I've heard this many times. Well, God, I believe God is sitting on a mountain. And there are a lot of different ways to climb the mountain. There are a lot of different ways to God. Look at me. God's not on a mountain. And there are not many ways to God. God is on a throne. And there's one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And if I said anything else to you, I'd be telling a lie that I have to give an account for, and I don't want your blood on my hands. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. God's not on a mountain. 
That's the goofiest thing you can say. Goofy is a Hebrew word. All right. Jesus said in John 10, 7 through 9, so Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, the Greek, amen, amen, I say to you, I'm the door, not a door, I'm the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. God is going to judge sinners sovereignly. You will not enter heaven your way. You will enter heaven God's way or you won't enter. There's only one way through Jesus Christ. He's going to judge sinners sovereignly. And then he's going to judge us, not us, but sinners systematically. Systematically. Look very quickly at verses 12 and 13. And I saw the dead You don't want to be in that group. The great and the small. It's talking about people that are not only physically dead, but spiritually dead. Standing before the throne. These are those who have not repented of their sins or believed savingly in Jesus. They're soberly referred to as the dead. Physically dead, spiritually dead, and about to die for eternity. They'll die, but they'll never die. They'll just keep on living in death. They're about to suffer eternity in hell. Verse 12 said, and the books were open. What books? Verse 13, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. What in the world is all that? Just as Christians will be judged for our works to to determine our rewards or loss thereof, Lost people are going to be judged by books in heaven that God keeps where everything you think, everything you say, every act you perform, and every attitude you have is all recorded in heaven. Those are your earthly works. And listen to me. When you, if you're lost and you stand before God, you won't be able to say, You can't send me to hell. I deserve to go to heaven. You won't be able to say that. Because once you see all your works, you're going to know that the judge of all the earth is doing right in not letting you go to heaven. Nobody's going to be able to contest it. Nobody. King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14, for God will bring every act to judgment, every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, You may say, well, nobody saw it. Yes, they did. God did, whether it's good or bad. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, but I tell you that every careless word, you know what that means? Words you shouldn't have said. How many of you ever said words you shouldn't say? Anybody? I have. Every careless word, every thoughtless word, every word you shouldn't have spoken. If people speak, they'll give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. The brother of Jesus, Jude, said this in Jude chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones, that's the angels and the saints, to execute judgment on the people of the world, lost people. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done, that's their deeds, and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken, that's their speech. Hey, look at me. Look at me. God keeps the books. God knows what you've done, what you've said, what you've thought. God keeps the books. You don't, I don't, God does. Jesus said in Luke 8, 17, for nothing is hidden that will not become evident. All your secrets, if you're lost, are going to be exposed to all of heaven at the judgment seat. Nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. You can hide it in the dark on this earth, but it's going to be before everybody and before Jesus at the judgment. But that's not the only book, the book of all your sins. God's got a record of it, every bit of it. 
But there's another book, and it's even more important. Verse 12, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Jesus in Luke 10 had sent out his disciples to witness and all. They came back, oh, man, the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them in Luke 10, 20, nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits, that is the demons, are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Every morning when I get up and I pray, one of the things I do is say, Lord, I, I thank you for food to eat, clothes to wear, a roof over my head. And I want to thank you today, Lord, that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the most important thing in your life, the book of life. If you don't know that today, why in the world would you leave 22,000 appling? without knowing that your name is in the book of life. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. That is, everyone who had died at sea and did not receive a proper burial will rise and now stand. Their, their, their remains will be brought back together. Their body will come back together and be resurrected in their soul and spirit. Their lost soul and spirit will stand before God. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. Death gave up the dead bodies, and Hades gave, gave up the dead souls and spirits, and they were joined together to stand before God, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Again, no one can deny the facts of their sinfulness. No one can say that God's judgment is unfair. The judge of the earth will do right. This is the great white throne of judgment. Jesus talked about it, or Paul talked about it in Acts 17, 31. Because he's fixed a day, God has, to, in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, that's Jesus whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. Hebrews 9, 27 says, Inasmuch as it is appointed for all men to die once, and after that, not in reincarnation, forget that, that's a lie out of hell. Not cessation of spirit, no. Not temporary punishment, then you get in, no. After this comes judgment. God will judge systematically. He keeps the books. He'll judge sovereignly, he'll judge sinners systematically, and he will judge severely. And I don't have time to elaborate on this. I'll preach a whole sermon on it next week, but let's just look at it very quickly. Verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Death, the opposite of life, is going to be thrown into hell. Hades, the opposite of paradise, is going to be thrown into hell. That's the second death, the lake of fire. Verse 15, most sobering verse in the Bible. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And I want to say this to you. There are going to be a lot of religious people at the white throne of judgment. There are going to be preachers who go to hell. Jesus said so in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Again, works don't save you, but if you don't have any works, it's because if you don't have any fruit, if you don't have any works, it's because you don't have any root, you don't have Jesus. If you have Jesus as your root, you will have some fruit. If there's no fruit, there's no root. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he who proves his salvation by his good works. Many, not just some, but many, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? Think about that. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Look, it's not so much, do you know Jesus? That's not the primary question. The question is, does Jesus know you? I never knew you. And you don't want to hear these words. Depart from me. You practice 
lawlessness. Oh, but we prophesied in your name. I went to seminary. I preached and I pastored churches. And I was a preacher and I even gave words of prophecy. That doesn't get you into heaven. Being a preacher doesn't get you into heaven. Jesus gets you into heaven. Amen. Oh, but I cast out demons. That just means that the name of Jesus, when you invoked the name of Jesus over that demon, it came out. It wasn't bowing to you. It was bowing to the name of Jesus. That just means the name of Jesus is strong. It doesn't mean that you're saved. I saw miracles take place. Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a miracle, a sign. Just because miracles take place, just because you pray for somebody and they get healed doesn't mean you're saved. There are going to be people that think they're saved, that sat in church pretty regularly, gave money. There are going to be preachers out of pulpits. Now, I'm not, look, I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation. But I'm telling you this. You'd better know that you know that you know Jesus Christ. Because if it's not real... It won't stand at the judgment. Are you ready to stand one on one before God? I'll ask you one more time. Don't answer out loud. But deep in your soul, ask yourself, ask yourself, don't think about anybody else. Ask yourself, am I ready to stand before God one-on-one? -on -one? Am I ready to stand eyeball to fiery eyeball with Jesus Christ. Am I ready for him to look at me with those eyes of, eyes of fire that will see through all the things that my friends couldn't see, that my family couldn't see? He knows it all. Am I ready? Because look at me. I, you may not like me after this sermon, but I'm not here with all due respect. I'm not here to make you mad, but I'm not here for you to like me. I'm here, and I'm not trying to grandstand even saying this. I'm here to tell you what that book says. And that book says you're going to stand before God, and He's going to look at you with eyes of fire. Jesus is. And you're going to give an account to God. You ready for that? You ready for that? Let's bow our heads. I want us to do something different. We don't need any music right now. I just want to see a show of hands on something. If you're a Christian here today, you know that you're saved. And you say, Pastor, God has spoken to me today. And I've got some things in my life right now. Now look, I'm not going to trick you. I'm not going to say, okay, now if you raise your hand, you come. I'm not going to do that. But if you say, I've got some things in my life that, to be frank with you, don't need to be there some attitudes, some words, some deeds, some thoughts. And I want to repent right now. I don't want that between me and God. Is there anybody like that here today? Just lift up your hand. I'm all around, all around, all around. 
Let's just take a moment, confess it to the Lord, and repent of it, and ask Him to forgive you. All the guilt will be gone. All the guilt will be gone. Just say, Lord Jesus, I confess to you, and then you name what it is. I repent of it. I don't want it. God, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you cleanse me from that sin. Now, is there anybody in this room that you don't know? When you stand before God, if you're going to stand at the Bema to give an account of your works as a Christian, or at the white seat, at the judgment seat of the white throne, as a lost person, you say, I don't know if I'm saved or lost. If there's anybody like that, if you're truly broken over your sin, if you are truly wanting to repent, I don't want to give you the problem without giving you the solution. So pray with me. Let Jesus save you right now. But it, listen, it's not mouth and words. It's more than that. It's laying your heart out before God. Pray something like this. If you don't want to pray these exact words, that's fine. But you pray what God tells you to pray. Just say something like this. King Jesus, I bow before you now. And I want to tell you that I am sorry for my sins. And I turn from my sin. With your help, Lord, I repent. And Lord, I acknowledge and I believe today that Jesus, you died and paid the sin debt for me on the cross. And I believe in my heart that you rose from the dead. And I ask you right now, as humbly as I can, Lord, please, Lord. And by the way, if you don't know that you're saved, pray this with me. Say, please, Lord Jesus, save me right now. I call on your name. Oh, God in heaven, I want to live for you so that when I stand before you, all will be well. In Jesus' name, amen.